It's 20 yards, literally 20 paces. It's 20 yards. That's amazing. Uh, we're live. We're live for the end of that. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Weekly Strength Club Q&A. Uh, people in the chat, let me know if my audio is okay. I listened to some of last episode. My audio was shit. Nobody told me, so I blame you, the viewer. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're doing the... Oh, we got Dale in the chat. He said, do the five. Five. Thanks, Dale. We appreciate the comments. Um, but uh, oh, thanks, Sinclair. He said audio is fine. Um, yeah, so we're continuing the New Year's series. I'm here with my boy Chase. Chase has just recently finished coaching. How did that go, Chase? It was good. We had a uh, 545 session that comes into about 715. So I was cutting it close, right? So I'm like, uh, you know, like the scene from like Die Hard where you're just cranking you down the bomb timer. Things. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had finished with that. We had our, we had normally five people, but two couldn't make it. So we had three and, uh, yeah, it was a good session. Good session. Good. Good. What's the, what was the population for that session? Was it all the elderly? Was it the youngins? No, Who was I, had, this one? I had the spectrum, man. So I had an 11 year old, our youngest okay. member there. And then we had two women. One of them is early forties, about mid forties. And then we had an older lady um, who's in her 50s. She's a radiologist. Uh, just started. She's the newest one in that group. And Sick. she's kicking ass. She's kicking nice. ass. I love radiologists. Yeah, and it's, 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 and I, I love this whenever this happens. So she kind of had a rude awakening today. And it was about carbs, about like you need carbs to train. What a surprise. She, yeah. So she's like, I ate a banana beforehand. I'm like, that's not going to work. Like you need like three rice cakes and some peanut butter in between those. So we can just get this nasty pump going. Mm. All right. We have L7 D in the chat. Coaches are live. We're always alive. Sometimes we feel a little bit more dead inside. Kasari and Mr. 405. Hopefully I'll get a nickname soon. L7. Hopefully. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're continuing the new year series. That's Chase Lindley at the bottom. He's a coach of starting strength, Oklahoma city. Um, I'm Alex Kasari. I do a bunch of training camps with a lot of my athletes. Um, if you want to contact us, here are our contacts. Um, Chase's Instagrams at Chase Lindley and Chase underscore Lindley. Um, he posts cool lifts from his gym and then a lot of bathroom selfies. Um, if you need or have any questions for me, um, you can reach me at my website. And if you want videos on the show, we do a bunch of form checks. We have like eight to get through today that came in from last week. Um, uh, you can email them to support at strength.club. Um, I moved the quote, the very important quote this time. Um, Alex, so sorry. Nice. <laughs> that was actually an elementary school nickname. It was. That was, uh, I think that was, that popped up in third grade. It lasted Did like a whole year. you just have like year. some PTSD flashbacks? After reading that, I know. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, it's it's the trauma. It's just too yeah. deeply embedded. Alex, so sorry. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're gonna think too hard about this, according to Mark Ripito, and we'll have some fun with it. Uh, Chase, anything else you wanna you wanna shill while we're at the front of the video? Um, no. It's That's the, it. We had a good. When are you selling your next uh, weightlifting template for twenty nine ninety nine on Instagram? I haven't finished it yet, but um, I'm it? I'm trying to get all the accessories down out in right like so a bunch of um i have mm -hmm. some what's the uh the weightlifter from china he always they always show like the uh the 10 kg plate flies i think it's like Lu, oh the yeah Lu there, like, like the, uh, yeah yeah he's over there doing dude i love i love the Lu raises man he just does like yeah. super rom lateral raises those things are kick ass <laughs> yeah just impinge yeah. the fuck out of your shoulder and we'll get it going whenever chase figures out how to open up microsoft excel that client that that template is going to, it's going to kill everybody. Um, we have Brian Althouse. He says, I'm training would have the boys on in the background. I think that's the best. It would be weird if you stared at us the entire time, considering we're just talking. Um, how's it going, Brian? Uh, race Johnson. That's a good first name. Um, his name was race car. That makes complete sense. This is not surprising at all. Um, and we have Dale saying he's an online client of SS Houston apprentice, John Chung. He speaks highly of you, Chase. So that's good. Do you know, John? I oh, mean, John, he's a he's an outstanding apprentice. Hell, man, he's basically a coach now. He just needs to pass the damn thing. Um, you, Dale, you're in some good hands with with John. He's How big are the biceps? That's the most important question on John. So John's um, he's an MMA guy. Uh, he did Muay Thai for a while, so he's just like no body fat, whatever. 
So he he has like just all be. these variations and shit. Yeah, he's he's a hell of a lifter. Um, a man probably. after my own heart, truly. Yeah. Um. All right, we're gonna get into it. Uh, this is gonna be the uh how to make the most of your starting strength NLP. Um, how to min max the NLP, things like that. Um, we're gonna go. This is not terribly dissimilar to the ten tips video that Chase and I did uh, a few weeks ago, but it's part of the the New Year series. Essentially, you've decided to do the starting strength NLP or are considering it. Um, you have been browsing the Reddit or Facebook, or you just Googled barbells on Google and you found starting strength. You're here now for whatever godforsaken reason. Um, we're just gonna give you some general advice as to why all of this matters and everything like this. Um, Chase and I have not discussed this before, not because we're not prepared, but because we like to see fresh takes on the show. Um, Chase, do any of these pop out to you when you're going through this list? Um, a lot of these are kind of, they are intermingled. Like um, some of these are not prioritized as like one, two, three, four, but. Yeah. In um, no particular order. There. Yeah. These, these kind of rear their heads sometimes at the same time. Just depends on like what character we have coming into our doors. Um, but the one that really stands out to me, and I think uh, a lot of people just kind of overlook this, is definitely number one: why your first three months will matter. Yes, it gets lost in the it, it gets lost in translation a tremendous mm-hmm. amount, and it is absolutely infuriating um, for us coaches. Uh, even like it's, I mean, the percentage of people who I have on my roster who are in their first three months of training, it's it's near zero but I'll still have people redo an LP when I get them for many reasons. You know, even if you have someone who's like, yeah, you know, I've been in and out of the gym for four years, you know, um, Mm -hmm. you're still attempting to curate an experience that the LP has crafted for you. Um, Chase deals with a lot of people who are just like straight up new, right? Oh yeah. Like yeah, some people have never touched a barbell never even seen a barbell before in their life before coming into my doors. So like this, this first little bulletin right here, hits home Um, and to kind of elaborate a little bit on this further is there's a lot of distractions out there. Um, If you kind of are just new to this and you want to get generally stronger or just whatever you want to do with fitness, you see, you know, like athlete X is bullshit. You see uh, guys like John hack. If he somehow stumbled onto him, like Uh, like 576, like John, there's there's a bunch of shit out there that you don't really know what's happening. Right. And then you can get lost in a, a bunch of gray matter to where, you may be doing something that an, an advanced athlete should be doing or even an intermediate on your day one, and you're not going to have as significant gains um, as fast as possible as we would with the first three months of doing a, a starting strength, not a linear progression. Yeah, it's a, I, I have more on that before. Race Johnson, our favorite racist. How tall are you, man? Are you actually going to put a hole in the ceiling with your press? <laughs> Me being only four foot nine, I've never even come close to doing that being medically a dwarf cool dude cool dudes cheer dudes in the chat is very similar to jeff riggins pal posting is what that is cool dude always comes in with the cheers um but yeah so one of the reasons why exercise is tricky um when it comes to curating an initial experience your first exposure to this sort of content um is that you can do things that a more advanced athlete would do. Like you can go and get Arnold's encyclopedia of bodybuilding. You can go and get a template from someone who doesn't really have a good, too great of a foundation in programming. You can get like a, you can just go and buy the third series of a template for an advanced athlete and do it. The lifting police are not going to stop you and you can, you can do it to some amount of success. So if you go in there and it's like, you know, 23 sets of squats across the week, you're squatting four times, you know, you're only benching twice and then you're deadlifting like uh, two or three times for maintenance. Cause it's like, Hey, this is a template specifically focused on bringing your squat up for some reason. And then like pressing and then deadlifting are on relative maintenance. You can do that. No one will stop you. Right. You may think that's the correct thing to do. If we compare this to something else, like if you're playing the piano, if you were to read the sheet music of a very complex or advanced piece of music, you would read this and say, I have absolutely no idea where to start. I can't even begin to attempt this. I'll be so wrong that I can't even get 1% of it done. With exercise, you can get some amount of it done. You know, you can go in and successfully complete that template. Is it the correct thing that you should have done? No. Um, this is why we really hone in on the first three months because it's just like yes you can kind of do whatever you want um but there generally are consequences to it depending on how much you care about it um race johnson said something here that was good i've never condensed this into a phrase but i will steal this and i will never credit you race johnson (laughs) he said templates are temporary programming is forever yeah 
I really love that. You know, like templates, it's it's kind of it's a it's a it's a training block for you to operate through. Programming is thinking about a series of decisions that you have to make. Um, Chase, what else to expand upon on the first three months? I have more to talk about here, but you go first. Um, yeah, it's. And I think one and two kind of tie in together. Like, why even do the novice linear progression again? Because these first three months, you see so much gainage in all your lifts, all just body weight in general, just anything that you thought you wanted to do before coming in, like, you know, increase body size, get muscle mass, all that stuff. It all happens at the three months. Like, this amount of growth that you're going to experience never happens anywhere else in your career, um, not even 10 years down the line not even 20 or even a year. Um, so these first three months are super, super crucial. Yeah, it's essentially, it, it's getting the taste in your mouth for programming. I'll have a lot of my athletes on my roster. You know, it's like, we'll, we'll start working together. They'll have a renaissance of progress, even if, you know, regardless of what their current state is, because they're just doing, you know, intelligent programming for the first time. And then they'll be like, and then they'll say, you know, like, hey, I, I really didn't know that programming could be like this. You know, like mm-hmm. what I'm doing, the volume totals that I'm doing, the workload I'm doing, the intensity distribution. It's like, I really didn't know that this is how it worked at all. So like, this is cool. It's generally like, I don't want to say experience of shock, but it's just, it's kind of, a, it is not uncommon for people to be like, wow, I was exercising for many years. That's pe- that's mostly the people who I get are people who have been like career exercisers or career athletes. Um, they maybe have been in the gym and around physical culture for 10 years, but they may not have had correct programming really at any point in time. Um, so, If you can curate your first three months in such a way where you're doing things correctly and well, you are miles ahead of everybody else. Um, Most people do not continue exercising for really any length of time. They'll generally do kind of three months to a quarter-ish, and then they'll just fall off. Um, This kind of holds for a lot of hobbies. I'll see this in judo. I'll see this in BJJ. I'll see this. I'm sure Chase has seen this in his respective sports. People start them. They don't stick with them. Um, why is this? It could be your coach. It could be the logistics of getting there. It could be just be the general difficulty. It, it could. Be, there's a, there's a million things that go into these decision making processes. Um, but the the more advantages that you can give yourself, the better, right? So it's like if you have a piano tutor and you just started playing the piano and he is an absolute dick, you're not going to continue playing the piano. You know, um, if you go in and it's like, hey, you know, you're doing a Shaco novice program, which is meant to have an athlete who's been doing like six years of GPP from whenever they were eight to 14. That's his novice program, right? Um, if you do that novice program and you have an absolutely terrible time of it, what do you think your probability is for continuing exercise indefinitely? You know, um, so yeah, the first like a- three months matter. It's almost like a 5,000 piece Lego set and you're trying to build like the Titanic without a blueprint, right? You're just like, oh, fuck, I see all these pieces, but I don't know what I'm doing with them. Yeah, I mean, Chase made a very, that's a, that's a good point. But like, it's, it's almost like exposing children to certain levels of information. It's just like, hey, you know, it's like we kind of do math in order, you know? It's just like, mm. we understand what integers are, we do addition and subtraction, and then we go to multiplication, then we go to division from there. You know, it's like, it's 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 a stepwise function. You can just kind of jump into it. Like, if you're illiterate, someone can just hand you a calculus textbook, and you can probably just figure it out, given enough mm. stress. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where... Uh, Oh, that's a good question, Dale. Um, but, it, but it's one of those things where the the more we can curate your initial experience, the uh, the better your results are going to be. Um, Dale Braithwaite, I believe is the name. Best LP you've ever witnessed. Highest numbers, question mark. What do you got, Chase? Um, in terms of best LP, um, I love seeing, and this is kind of a group of people. I love seeing people who walk in and they can't even squat to depth without something underneath them. So they're so deconditioned to where just their body weights to struggle seeing them three months down the line and they're repping out 135 on a squat that's the greatest man like it it is cool seeing Mm -hmm. like a kid go from you know basically like a 65 pound squat and in three months he gains you know 15 pounds 20 pounds and his fucking numbers are are impressive but it's it's not the same And, and it's definitely not the same impact on his life as it is the person who had struggle uh, just getting off the toilet. Now, highest numbers though. Mm, I'd say I've had like, uh, one guy get into the three hundreds with bench for LP. I've had one. Damn, really? Yep. Yeah, his was he was say, he's five three. He weighs about two ten. Just naturally, just naturally muscular guy. Done mm-hmm. a lot of wrestling his entire life. His arms barely reached his dick. Barely. They just. <laughs> Just the shortest little things. That's the highest bench I've seen. What do you got for squat and dead, Chase? 
Uh, squat, I think I've seen um, – I want to say there was a kid in Wichita that I had who was – he was kind of in high school. Uh, started around 125, and dude was like in the 200s in like three weeks. Just fucking <laughs> stupid easy. Yeah, uh, lines up for the growth spurt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But – again, like I, I work with such a, a niche of a population where it's like, it's, I don't really have like really good athletes coming in or like I have such young kids to where I, I just need to see them grow more. So it's going to take mm-hmm. a little bit more time to see those big numbers. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Like in the threes with their squat or something like that. Yeah. Um, L7D, he said, how about templates or temporary programming is forever. Uh, change to give a man a program, he'll get better for 12 weeks. Teach him programming, he'll improve forever. That's a neat one. I really like that. Um, yeah, I dig it a lot. Uh, but yeah, so we, we've kind of established why the first three months matter. We have some more people in the chat. If you have any questions or anything, please let us know. If you have videos, you can send them in. Go back a few minutes. You'll see the, the email address there. It's this one, support at strength.club. Um, we got a bunch for next week. Um, all right, so we're doing why the SSNLP. So, you know, you have decided to start exercising. You've arrived at this point, so you're likely somewhat bought into starting strength as a concept, why you would do the novice linear progression, meaning NLP, um, as opposed to strong lifts, um, gray skull LP. I think there's the Bulbasaur or something like that. There's, there's a program that has a Pokemon as a like name. I'm pretty sure it's like the Bulbasaur beginners program. I'm going to look this up when Chase is talking at some point, cause I could be hallucinating. I've had a lot of, <laughs> we have a lot of concussions. So we, we don't know this could, where this come from. Um, yeah. So you're, you're coming over from some random ass program. This could be literally be P 90 X. This could be a program mm-hmm. that your trainer put you on in the gym and you're here now. Um, Chase, what, in for you separates the SSNLP as opposed to these other beginner or introductory programs. So I think this is your first taste of the distinguishment between training and exercising. Um, so programs like P90X, yeah, with all that bullshit of muscle confusion and stuff, it's basically almost something different each time you're going in. Um, especially for if you've never seen anyone who had a stick stuck with like a program before and they walk into a Gold's Gym, like they're just kind of aimlessly wandering out to the next machine. Um, doing various reps and sets. They don't really know the, or what they're doing. So that's kind of a different exposure there. But with the starting strength novice linear program, you have a set number of reps and sets. You know the exercise selection that you're going to do, and you're going to follow that until it doesn't work. And then we have another book, right, Practical Programming, where it tells you the variables that we need to change. All this is happening in congruence with you trying to achieve a physiological adaptation, right, the science behind it of you getting stronger. And I, I know no one's really thought about this to as much of a detail as rip and everyone who's contributed to the books as anyone else out there. So I looked it up, everybody. It is the Ivy sore for a eight workout program. I was like, ball of sore, Ivy sore. Who is this from? I think that's, it's evolved. <laughs> yes, evolved it is. It, right? Bulbasaur best starter, by the way. Always my pick every time. Um, but yeah, so it's the IV sore workout program. That's another very popular beginner one. I have no idea why. Um, but yeah, so what Chase was uh, saying there, a lot of very good points in there. For me, I think the quick take home is it has very clearly defined goals. Most people, when they go to the gym, they're like, ah, I'm just trying to get fit. Ah, I'm just trying to look better. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, the SSNLP has very clearly defined and laid out goals. The preface of the book, it's a gem. Why strength read it. I believe they have that excerpt posted a few other places on the website. Um, but, but yeah, so it's like you have very clear wind conditions, you know, exactly what you're going to do. The point of it isn't just to like, you know, go at full speed. I'm going zero to 60 as fast as I can. It's a slow technical accumulation of skill. Um, and it's, it's, it's giving you, it's putting that best foot forward in such a way where it's like, Hey, I'm not trying to give you, you know, four ab movements to do that you need to spread across your week. And then three bicep movements, and three tricep movements on top of your main lifts that everything has five sets of five. Cause that's a magic number for some reason. Um, it's like, it's, it's a moderate low model moderate dosing of volume so you can focus on the scale of lifting because it's a thing that you have to do you should be doing it well has very clearly defined wind conditions um which is why we really like the ssnlp and it it says in the book very clearly it works until it stops working and then you move on to more advanced things 
you know, um, it's not something where it's like five, three, one forever, where it's like, Hey, just continually kind of repeat this cycle. It's just like, you can figure out how to do it. You know, it's a, I think it's, it's a little bit foolhardy to say that you can just kind of repeat a template forever. And that's what a lot of these things end up doing where it's like, Hey, well, why do the people at starting strength or on the starting strength subreddit don't look like they've lived? It's like, they've been lifting for two months, mm-hmm. you know, what do you want? It's not really the point. Um, the book itself, do you think that someone can run a successful LP without reading the book just by the resources else used elsewhere? So like website, forum, Facebook, Strength Club, our YouTube page, things like that. Oh, definitely. Um, just the, the grow in our our franchise and stuff where the, our, I mean, the amount of content on YouTube alone, it's basically the book, but just in videos and you actually visually learning instead of you reading and, and kind of ha- comprehending what Riff's trying to say. Um, but I still think it's important to read the book because due to the YouTube overlords and stuff like that, we may be taken down. I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of external factors, um, that you don't really have control over deeming what's worthy on technology and what's not as the book, right? You can reread it. You can uh, see some illustrations and stuff. And it takes a little bit of some, for some people, a little bit more, you know, mental acuity to see, uh, what Mm -hmm. we're trying to tell you and kind of deduce. Um, all the tech, the technical aspects of it, but um, I like the written stuff, so you can actually see everything planned out. And, and even on videos, people always write, um, you know, future programming blocks and how it's changed. And we do this at the seminars where our programming lecture we start out simple and we show you the variables that we change uh, from the squat, taking that into account with like reps and sets, and just a bunch of other cool stuff that. You, mm-hmm. We have we don't post it, of course, on YouTube because we want you to come to our seminars, but. Um, <laughs> I, I highly recommend reading the book. Yeah, it's um, it is a guided experience as books mm-hmm. are. It's not a mishmash of random pages. Um, I just went to the Starting Strength YouTube in a different tab. There are thirteen hundred and six videos. What did it say? Thirteen hundred and six videos. Um, even if you go through, like, let's say you do the playlist, and even if you're using it as curated as you can, you can jump around. Like YouTube autoplay and the sidebar mm-hmm. for recommendations will not be as consistent. So it's not like, hey, you know, you just learned about hip drive and the squat. Maybe now we should recommend squat grip videos. The, it's 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 not that hyper curated the book is it's written very intentionally right so it's just like in the squat chapter you're getting all of like the intro physics 101 lessons that you need to help conceptualize the rest of the things in the book once you get to the deadlift chapter you have this big lesson on pulling mechanics which helps out the power clean and everything else like it's a it's a curated experience it's a little bit dry like you have to be good at reading books i would say um the audiobook has been a blessing i've directed a lot of people to the audiobook and a lot of people have very much so enjoyed that you can just listen to it on your way to and fro work um but the the book is very helpful because again you're learning a skill you know um you're learning how to begin exercising as a concept you're not actually not exercise but training is part of your life you know um so investing a little bit of time for a for a book that's not terribly expensive it, it, it's very worth it um anything else you want to cover from the first three we're now into the semi-coherent ranting point number four um anything you want to cover or anything we think we missed for for one through three Man, this this kind of revolves around too, like coaching. Um, so let's say, you know, you found out starting strength, and you know this is the thing that you want to do, and you've read the book, but it still kind of doesn't make sense. Find a coach. Um, we do online coaching, right? This is where we kind of plug in um, our our little jost here, right? Um, but yeah, just find a coach, and it takes again what Alex was saying, all that complicated stuff in the book. You have it in literally human form someone who can explain it a different way. He's a teacher, right? Uh, so he's teaching you these hard concepts and making it simple. Um, I highly advise coaching, um, getting somewhere that you can, you know, in person or online, find someone who knows the material and can help you out. Yeah. Um, I wish there was some sort of, I, I don't know if I even thought about it enough to, to kind of equate this, but we'll say like in, in the martial arts world, like if you're, if you're wrestling someone or if you're doing grappling with someone um, and you have like belt ranks on them, about 30 pounds of mass equals a belt. So like if you have like a 150 pound black belt versus some guy who's like 270 pounds, it's probably going to be pretty even, you know what I mean? Cause it's like that extra weight just kind of equates for the skill. Um, with coaching and learning the lifts, I literally think if you're not that athletic of a person, one good afternoon with a starting strength coach is like three months of learning how to do the movements on your own. 
it's that's it. Like people just aren't attentive enough. They're not watching their own films. They don't really know what they're comparing it to. They don't have a good mental model of the lifts. Um, there are certain things that you can get by learning things yourself over time and how to self organize those techniques. Um, but like getting good coaching in the beginning in an immediate exposure, it's wonderful for not having bad habits. Like if we take it back to an instrument thing, it's like you could probably figure out how to play some very basic songs on a guitar and you may be holding it very incorrectly for future songs right so it's like if you have your hands all janky for some reason you can probably get away with playing star spangled banner or something simple um but once you need to do something more complicated you don't have the fundamentals down so coaching greatly expedites that process like chase was saying so you're um, not supposed to play the piano you know blindfolded i thought you were supposed to like not look at the keys and just bang shit around you know what speaking of banging keys around i think a really good example of this is older people typing if you watch older people typing, they will they'll, <laughs> like sometimes they'll lick their finger before they go for a button because they'll think it's a page. But they'll, they'll I've like, never he- seen that. But they'll headhunt with <laughs> with specific. Yeah, I've, I've seen like just the index finger typing thing. Yes, exactly. Where it's just like they probably didn't have a formal typing class. If you were kind Do of you know in that, that, you know that Rip had basically wrote the book like that, just like one finger at a time. Like that's how he <laughs> the today. I'm yeah, not either hand it. smoking a pipe one finger at a time that's how intense that's how much intent and crack hair was taken to the book um but yeah we should get him a stenographer or addiction software for for christmas mm. um but yeah so if you watch like older people typing who have no formal education typing they may be able to type like 40 words per minute doing the single like headhunter style like bam 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 like one key at a time um if you watch a younger person type you know, just because of like, they've, they've likely had some rudimentary class to do it in elementary school. And they're like, yeah, we can all type 90 words a minute without thinking at all. Cause we early on in the learning process, we had a correct teaching exposure. Mm-hmm. That's all it takes. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's, that's, that's very similar. Um, it's funny to hear that, that Rip does that. Um, yeah. Doing your chin ups, I think is a big one. This is one of my favorites as someone who is a fetishist for the chin up chase. What, the, what do you, what thoughts do you have on this? Uh, I agree, but there's kind of a cutoff, right? Um, to a certain age group, I think the younger, the more athletic you are. Yeah, you got to do your chin ups. Like, don't don't cheat yourself. But um, if you're on the really deconditioned end, if you're on the the elderly side, don't worry about it. Uh, we can kind of get you stronger a different way. Yeah, yeah. Do your chin ups, and then you know, lat pull downs. If you're an old geezer, you know, um, if you if you haven't left the ground in 20 years for any sort of reason (laughs) don't (laughs) don't just jump up to a bar um but uh but yeah so doing your chin-ups i think it serves a few purposes in the lp everybody early on has the urge to do accessory work they're like oh i wouldn't do my curls i wouldn't do my shoulders i wouldn't do my triceps all that shit the 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 chin-ups really are a good way to you know temper that extra energy i would say you know um because it's like hey you just did all these hard lifts do three sets of chins to failure see if you still want to do curls after that chances are you don't if you're taking them to full failure you know um i think the chins prevent people from doing a bunch of other stupid shit in the gym which they really shouldn't be wasting their time on early on unless it's just for fun i guess um but yeah do your chin-ups it it really it really helps out with everything really 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 all the lifts um i don't think having extra lats and extra back muscles are detrimental for anything um this is a big one i think it's called pacing your lifts how to pace your lifts um upright rows for life homie the upright row gang, uh, <laughs> best racist rowing is the upright row variation. Um, Chase, do you remember your upright rowing video? Uh, yeah. Do you yeah, still I'm have st- that shirt? The not an SSC? The not an SSC. No, I, th- I think I threw that away as soon as I was done. Oh my God. No, because I was shame. pissed off because I think that was right after I failed the, uh, my first oral exam or no, no, it was the, the written exam. I failed <laughs> that and I was like, God, and then I think it was either Rusty or Nick. They're poking fun of me because they're like, dude, don't worry about it. Like, you know, everyone always fails oh, at least once in, in some that's regard. So funny. Like, but I took it hard. I was like, God damn it. I'm an idiot. And then they, they wrote that. And I'm like, thanks. Thank thanks, guys. guys. That's really funny. You should wear that now, even to this day. Yeah. And sure. next next conference that they have, you got you to gotta wear that. Um, race. I, I've never been able to figure out the upright row. Some people think they get like a really good connection to their delts with the upright row. I can't. I, I, I hate them. I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't see a need for them at all. (sighs) You got to chase the bodybuilding lifestyle. I think that's, that's the real point here. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so pacing your lifts chase when I, whenever I put this point in here, chase did not 
this what does this conjure in your brain, Chase? So whenever I first read this, I'm thinking of um, let's say like your squats kind of really going um, and it's it's exploding more so than your other lifts. So like uh, your press is still kind of stalling. Um, your your deadlift really isn't that heavy. Maybe your bench is kind of lagging a little bit, but your squats is perfect. You have to do other things to make those lifts kind of come up and and not just waste so much time and focusing only on the squat, right? Like we need all of these lifts to progress at a nice steady pace in order for you to see the most benefit out of the program. Yeah. Okay. That, all right. We're on, we're, right idea. Yeah, we're on, yeah, we're, we're on a very similar page. It's cool. funny. Cause a lot of people really get all up in their hoo-hahs about like muscle imbalances and, and physique yes. and all that stuff early mm-hmm. on, but they won't really care about pacing their lifts correctly. Um, so pacing your lifts uh, priorities is to have your deadlift being more mature than your squat. We want your bench to be more mature than your deadlift. Note that I'm saying more mature for a lot of these things and not like tremendously like 60 pounds heavier or a hundred pounds heavier. It doesn't need to be that specific. Um, but like, you know, if you're someone who just has really bad leverages for the deadlift, your deadlift is never going to be 250 pounds or hundred pounds or 75 pounds higher than your squat. It may just be 30 pounds higher than your squat, but we want it to be more mature and more developed for i hate to use the word developed again but for development reasons of your physique you know it's just like if if you're worried about t-rex mode make sure your deadlift is more mature than your squat um i think the the muscles that are primarily using the deadlift all that posterior chain stuff it greatly facilitates the squats growth you know um and the same thing for the bench press like if you are benching 135 and for some reason your press is at 95 or not really 95 if your press is at 115 because you started them both at the empty bar you're never going to be able to press much higher than that. You know, you're pressing your bench are too close together and you need to let the bench grow so that the press can follow it. Um, So Chase, after that, what do you got? Um, I think this is also a telltale sign of like, if you fuck up on the form or not. Um, So like, let's say your deadlift is super low. Like um, you're still trying to struggle with like 155 and your squats about 135. No, that shouldn't be the case, man. Like you should be in the twos already. If Mm -hmm. not, you know, way past that. So th- that's a good indicator of you fucked up the technique on the deadlift. You're struggling with something. Um, go back and, and reread or watch the five step setup. Um, bench kind of the same thing. Like you could be um, messing around with a grip to where it's either too wide, too narrow, or um, uh, you are just not taking big enough jumps. Uh, those again, like w- if we go back to like that first point of like the three months, this is the most crucial part the amount of gains that you're going to have, like you will not have this ever again. So take as much, I wouldn't say run or just run with it as best you can with adding as much weight that you can, especially with the deadlift and the bench. Um, And Alex made a good point with don't start relatively too light, right? Work up to a weight that you can actually handle and properly have good technique with all the lifts, but not too much that you're actually hamstringing yourself where like your squats, maybe, you know, like a 45 pound bar, you could be squatting 95 that day. Like, so you, yeah. you're not getting, you're not getting anything out of it if you go too light. So just start a little bit heavier. This is one of the reasons why I think coach early on is so goddamn important. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. I'll hear from, I've heard from many people who unironically have started all of their lifts at 45 pounds. They're like, well, I just started with the empty bar and I went up everything in, you know, equal intervals on all lifts together. It's like, what? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, this is covered in the book. It's covered in a lot of other places, but it's something that just kind of slips through the cracks. So we can talk about it here. Um, the deadlift should start heavier than the squat. The bench should start heavier than the press. Um, as a coach, essentially what we're looking for, we're looking for something that is slowing down a little bit. It's slowing down enough to challenge the lifter technically, but not so much that it's breaking them technically. Um, we don't want to see form degradation. We want to see something challenging within the form. Um, so like for a guy, you know, let's say if his, if he was really good at it with the amount of musculature he had, his best deadlift would be like 205 day one. We would take him at like 165, 155, somewhere around there, you know, um, and then his squat may be 105, 115. But then as he grows, that deadlift increase may be 10 pounds, 10 pounds, 10 pounds, and then five past that. Whereas the squat may be five every time past the first session. Um, so it's like, we want those things to grow in pairs. You know, the deadlift helps facilitate the squat. The bench helps facilitate the press. Um, 
taking bigger deadlift increases early and often like the deadlift, it's just one set. You can probably add 10. Sometimes you can add 20 pounds on the first mm-hmm. session or two. Um, but you want to add 10 pounds for as long as you can. Um, Chase, how often, let's say on, you know, 40 year old guy who's just started, how many 10 pound increases are pretty normal on a deadlift after day one? Um, I'd say about three sessions, maybe a week. Three? About a week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So like, let's say if you started at 135 and your squat was 115 at the at the beginning of next week, you know, your deadlifts should be coming in at 175, you know, um, and then your squats probably coming in, you know, uh, about 20, 30 pounds uh, heavier than it was originally. Um, last with bigger increases, you know, like if we were to compare the heaviest lift, the deadlift to the lightest lift to the press, um, you may end up taking, you know, one, two, you may, let's say two pound jumps for ease, uh, on your press earlier than you even need to. The deadlift may still be going, you know, at five pounds a week or five pounds a session, excuse me. Um, maintaining high deadlift frequency. Uh, I think this is huge. This is a, a big part of this is a technique as a function. Um, I've noticed people who are bad deadlifters, they feel like they have to drop the deadlift early because it's so much more taxing. Have you have you seen that before, Chase? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I kind of was one of those people where like I instantly just kind of dropped it down and I was like, ah, I'll just do my chins that day. No, if you suck at something, it's more beneficial to work on it even harder. Um, so finding a way around that little hiccup, maybe... It's not three, three deadlift sessions, but maybe it's a deadlift rack or deadlift or uh, some sort of halting, some other m- maybe manipulation of the range of motion to where you're helping your technique. But at the same time, it's high enough in the intensity realm to where you're not getting any D training out of it. Yeah, um, that kind of goes into uh, exercise selection towards the end of the LP. Yeah. Once things stop working, we have a bunch of other videos on that. Um uh, L7D had a question. Uh, he said, how do you identify or define good or bad form? Is it one of those things you just know when you see it applying common sense? Um, this is a bigger question than most people would assume. Yeah. If you are using the relevant muscle groups, if the lifter is staying balanced in such a way where it is not distracting for them to complete, um, complete the lift, uh, and it's comfortable. I would say that's the bare minimum for good technique. That's it. Yeah, de- definitely the balance issue. Um, are you doing it pain free? Um, is it? I'm trying to think. I mean, those are kind of the big ones. I mean, yeah, I think like it's that, it's hard to say because there, there's this realm of good technique versus efficient technique. Efficient technique. Go read the book Starting Strength. There's a bunch of shit in there about it. The arguments are very clearly laid out. Yeah. If you're going for good technique of just like, eh, is it good enough to work? Is it good enough to be palatable? It's just like, is the lifter not falling over? Is the lifter comfortable? Is he doing anything wildly inefficient so that he's not working the target muscle groups? Like, mm-hmm. are his calves getting really pumped out and sore when he's benching? He's probably doing something weird. I would say that's bad technique, you know, um, but things the, like the that. Cool, yeah, the cool thing about this program, though, is that you can do something I mean, not blatantly wrong, like let's say like sumo deadlift, but you can deadlift with um, a weird grip or you can mm-hmm. even squat in it with a different bar position than a low bar bar or low bar bar position. <laughs> you you can still get pretty damn strong. And there's a hundreds of people that have done this before coming to see a coach or coming to the seminar where they've gotten pretty damn strong doing things kind of fucked up, right? And, you know, that's yeah. where now there's, there's come this, a crucial point where maybe they can't handle with that form technique going up five more pounds. They tweak something or something hurts, but that's like, again, at the end of the novice linear progression, it's not day one or the next session. Like they're mm-hmm. usually fine after that. Yeah. I, I've noticed that bad technique tends to be a rate limiter. So like, let's say if you're just pressing really far in front of your shoulder, like in soon, so your press doesn't go here, your press goes like this and then comes back. You could probably do that for like the first, you know, I don't know, a few months of your training. Some people do this yeah. shit for years, frankly. Yeah. And eventually they'll be like, I can never get past 135 on my press. I don't know why. Technique is generally the reason why. Mm-hmm. From an efficiency argument. Is it good enough for them to like get a stimulus and be healthy? Sure. But you know, good versus efficient, I think is a big conversation. Um, uh, G lock in the chat. He said, I don't like deadlifting. Amen. Sister chase. Do you like deadlifting? I've come to love it now. I mean, hell, um, all I'm doing now is, is pulling. So you're doing, yeah, you're doing 85 deadlift variations a, a week. It just beats the shit out of me. Now it just beats me the fuck up regardless of when I'm deadlifting. I'm well, totally RD, RDL gang already. for life. 
that's the only thing I can tolerate anymore is the RDL. <laughs> God damn. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Dale, he said, uh, with the deadlift, if I break it off the floor, I can get the rep. I think I'm built for squatting, question mark. Um, and he said, overall, is it better to be built for squats or deads? Um, it just depends on, like, if you're Kurt Kowalski, I think he would say, yeah, it's, it's more beneficial to be built for squatting because he was not really good at deadlifting compared to the squat and the deadlift. But, um, I don't know. I don't think that question really matters unless you're like an elite level power lifter. And yeah. then once you know that, like you already know what your kind of your specialty is and you know what numbers to hit to make you win this meet or your weight class. But, um, but even then, like Kurt Kowalski squatted in the thousands, still pulled in the eight hundreds. Like this dude was still fucking strong. So I really wouldn't worry about like what's, I'm built for what is my limb length advantage, all that shit. Just get everything really damn strong. And then whatever is really strong going into like your intermediate style program, that's just how it's going to be. Like my squat was kind of like that for a while. And then I focused maybe more on training my deadlift. And now I, I surpassed my squat um, to where the ratio is about 100 pounds, maybe 75 pounds off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so, it yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter unless you care. That's the short yeah. answer. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, like if, uh, if you're trying to get the biggest booty in the world, being built for squatting is probably pretty sick. Um, you know, but if you're like, you know what, I want like three inch deep erector muscles in my back being built for deadlifts is probably pretty cool. Um, it kind of depends on the sport as well. You know, if you're doing a sport, if at all, but if for general health purposes, it really doesn't matter at all. Um, uh, Melchior Kaspar came down from his wizard tower to ask us this question. They may have Wi-Fi up there. I'm not sure. He said, why is the press considered a highly technical lift? On one hand, the kinetic chain is long, so optimal bar path is hard, but squats are much heavier, so deviation from bar path um, is higher moment arm, which I think he just means is harder to correct from. What do you think, Chase? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so he was right about the kinetic chain um, being the longest in the press, so that does not really work out well for the press. But at the same time, you got to look at the the muscle the muscles involved in the press versus the squat. So, for example, you're squatting right a one rep max of like four or five, and you kind of get off balance. You can kind of save that, I think, a little bit easier than a one rep max on your press of like two twenty five out in front of you, um, just due to the amount of muscle mass there is in the squat, getting you pulled back and handling that excess moment, getting you back into a proper balance point versus the press, you really don't have any of that, right? You have to put yourself into the proper position, the use of throwing your hips, all this technical aspect of it in order for the bar to travel in the most efficient way possible. Yeah, I, I would recommend, Melchior, you think about the amount of points of articulation involved in a traditional press versus a squat and then figuring out what the most technical or most the most common technical errors are and how you can save them you can really bullshit a squat up. If it's a sub maximal load and you botch the technique, I have unironically taken the step forward with 315 at the bottom with one of my legs because something scared me. And then I did like a weird split stance kind of Jefferson squat up to the finish. You can fuck around with squats. Something's on your back. If you have the musculature, you can do it. You can, you'll be totally fine. Um, with the press, you really don't have that much, you know, it's like if you, if you let your whole body go forward and you're just relying on like, you know, like, uh, your anchor toes pressing down in the ground to salvage your entire body backwards, plus a bar overhead, it's not going to work. Um, but it's like, let's say if you get a little bit forward in the squat, you can send the knees forward, you can show the hips up, you can round the back, you can fight the back back up. There's, there's so many w- things that you can do to, to save a squat. There's much less that you can do to save a deadlift. Chase is a really good presser because he can press, but now has like another quote unquote point of articulation that most people don't have. Chase can lay back the fuck out of the bar. And then that's a huge advantage for him, right? Cause it's like, if the bar is not moving, he now has another thing to help move the bar. Um, or it's like people who were like over extension in their spine is really painful for them. They basically just have to do a strict press no matter what, you know, yeah. um, uh, th- that, that's why I would say the press is considered a lot harder and uh, a lot harder and technical um, attributes for built for X. Uh, that's a, what do you think? Chase? Give the, give a 30 second answer. We're running out of time. I have no idea what he means. What are the attributes built for X? I think he means like what's built for squatting. What's built for blanky blank. Oh, okay. Um, just like bench, for example, like you're built like a barrel. Um, so just anything that is anthropometrically suited for the lift for the squat, it could be, 
um, a little bit of a, a smaller torso, longer legs to where now your, your squat, uh, your rather your femurs have more muscle mass to kind of build on, uh, deadlift, long limbs, um, short torso kind of mm-hmm. squashing the body down, but it's still increasing the, uh, expenditures or the, uh, the, the limb length. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To help you pull and, and reduce the range of motion. Yeah, like for a deadlift, if you could theoretically have like a hyper short torso in such a way where your back is, you know, like almost like straight up flat, but you have incredibly long arms, um, the range of motion that you have to pull through very short range of motion around the hip, also very short. That's kind of the goal. Um, I would say it, it it's being built for something means that you can configure your leverages in a lift in such a way you have to move the bar a very short distance. Second to that, I would say favorable muscle insertions and then like fiber type distributions within the muscle. Um, I think that's pretty accurate, Melchior, by the way. Um, we got to move on. We got to finish this up. Um, uh, we got a bunch of form checks to do. Um, I'm going to leave this one up just the rest of the show, I think. Fuck deadlifting. Gang, gang. <laughs> just annoying chase. Um, but uh, yeah, so we talked about the deadlift, how to manage the deadlift in the LP. I would say how and when to alternate pressing movements. I think a lot of people think the press is overly important early on and you know they'll be like, oh, I got to press. It's, it goes press, bench, press every single time. Um, and then their press will get basically to intermediate land for the amount of muscle and strength that they have. And their bench will, they'll be taking, you know, like small amounts of increases on the bench. Um, Chase, do you see these things often on people who have not had good coaching? Um, not so much of that. They're so stuck on just pressing all the time, but definitely we know that the press goes through the most changes the quickest. And then I, I do have, I have seen in my, uh, years of doing this, just the reluctancy of wanting to change and just manipulate certain variables for the press or the bench. It's okay to do that. Like we know that by definition, like the press, small amount of muscle mass, very technical. So you're not going to get this huge drawn out a hundred pound increase in like the next three months that you're doing this. So we need to do anything and everything that we possibly can. We're going to throw all the shit at the press to help increase it. And that's where, we use those variables that Alex was talking about to help distribute that. Yeah. It's the, uh, like, like it's okay if the press gets intermediate early, Mm -hmm. it may happen in your first three months. It may not. Um, I'll have a lot of people, very similar lines of thinking to the deadlift, take a few weeks of deadlift press, or excuse me, bench press, deadlift, bench press, deadlift. And so they're capping off the beginning and the end of the week with the bench. That way we're just giving the bench a, a lead. You know, we're giving it a bit of a runway so the press doesn't catch up to it too immediately. Um, you know, cause it's a, it's one of those things where the more attention that you can pay on those muscles with the bench, the high, the, I would say the, rel- the relatively higher magnitude of stimulus than the overhead press. You know, the weight is heavier. You're in a much better position to push from. Um, so making sure that you get that bench focus a little bit early can really uh, protract the length of your LP. Um, and then the next thing I think we should talk about is early weight selection and then increases. We touched on weight selection earlier on um, to say like, hey, do not start your bench at 45 pounds if you are an adult male who weighs 170 pounds. You know, um, don't go up five pounds every lift from 45 pounds. You know, it's it's just not going to work. Um, so we t- we talked about that earlier. Um, what would you say about uh, strategies for weight increases, Chase, and then preemptive microloading or microloading at all? Uh, for the weight increases, it depends on how well you feel comfortable with the technique. If you still feel like you're kind of struggling with it. Just safe route at five pounds. If you feel like on the deadlift, man, everything is super simple. Um, you just nailed it the first time that you did the the five step setup. Yeah, twenty pounds, ten pounds, it's fine. Um, squat, I, I kind of that's a hard one to kind of grasp sometimes because there's a bunch of shit that's going on in the squat. It's okay to do five pounds on the squat kind of at the start. Um, but for the preemptive microloading, no, again, like the press, the bench. Those guys need to get as strong as possible. I would not want to see someone just day one just adding two pounds, two and a mm-hmm. half pounds to the bar. We need as much room for them to gain as much strength as fast as possible. So the best way of doing that is five pounds, even ten pounds, if they're they're able to do that. Yeah, like if you're going from fifty five to sixty five, and you're 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 an adult male, that's that's probably fine for workouts, first mm-hmm. few workouts. I will see people going to five pound jumps on the deadlift when they could still be doing 10 or 20 immediately. Um, a lot. I'll see that a lot. Um, next thing I'll see is the people thinking they need to go up 
one pound, two pounds up in the press and be like, I just need to do this forever early when they don't really need to. Um, be brave is what I what just general recommendations for the LP, just just overall, be brave. Um, the only time I would ever say is that preemptive microloading is okay is if for some reason you have botched any of the above and you're like, oh, damn, I'm pressing 140 and my bench is like 170. You know, it's just yeah. like my bench is not ahead enough to make anything worth it. It's like, just so you can still have a little bit of progress on your press, you can just go up one pound at a time, you know, add a rep here or there, whatever. Um, and then let the bench grow more, but then I would change the frequencies. Um, but just make sure that you're not being a weenie about it and only adding a few pounds. Um, Chase, you got to take my boy, Andre, Andre's question while I get some videos going. Yep. So what's the anecdotal evidence on effect of moderate amounts of alcohol and recovery? Um, me, myself, like I, I usually try not to drink too much. I, like, I have the occasional beer and then, but like uh, in my days of kind of heavily drinking and fucking around with my friends, um, I've noticed that it's so alcohol is an inflammatory in the body. So if you have this huge of uh, uh, amount of inflammation due to your training. Now you're just adding a shit ton more from the ad external factor. It's going to affect you a little bit. Um, just the the concentration too of you wanting to power through a hangover. It's it's a bitch. So uh, I don't recommend you getting plastered and then trying to squat something heavy the next day. Um, if you're going to drink, be a little bit smarter about it. Um, know what you're having in your, your training going forward. If you're going to have like a huge volume day. Monday and then over the weekend you had you know a birthday party to celebrate you're gonna have to kind of plan around that yeah yeah Timmy said absolutely no one has a bigger press and bench unless you're Chase um uh, yeah uh Timmy <laughs> you don't know there uh, uh um but yeah, yeah, I think that's one thing people won't really realize that there's that the, the the bench is supposed to be significantly larger than the press will be. People who aren't super familiar with exercise, they think that like, oh, it's just a pushing movement. They should be pretty similar, right? So it's like I should be taking increases that are equitable on both. That's a super common thing that you'll see from people who aren't hyper familiar with exercise. Um, you know, uh, Chase is the exception. That could no, be Chase's I, nickname, the I'm exception. Not, Tim, I just I just don't give a fuck about the bench. I. The bench is terrible. It's like uh, Alex hate towards the deadlift. I have that for the bench. Fuck the bench. God. I also hate the bench. The oh. squat too. The overhead press. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so we're watching this guy. His his name is Coach Carp. He sent in three videos. We're gonna get through them. Um, I believe there's three fifteen on the bar, or they're just thicker forty fives. I don't know. Um, so this is a high bar squat. The depth is questionable. How do you feel about him, Chase? Yeah, super high. Um, and he's wanting to crank his chest up out of the bottom, shove out the knees, make some room in between your legs, place the belt in between your legs, That's and drive your ass up. Yeah, I think with a this seems like a high bar shoulder flexibility issue. If I had to guess, yeah. looking at the uh, looking at the demographic, so uh, driving the hips up can be a little bit uncomfortable. Give it a try. Deload, de take some weight off the bar. You, you won't die. It won't break your neck or anything. Um, it, the, I would say if you're having to think about hip drive on high bar squat, you may have to think about pulling the bar down, like rolling it down your back at the same time. Um, because as your torso gets more inclined, the bar really is in a great position in high bar, so it can roll up on you. Um. But yeah, I think I would widen the stance up as well. The stance looks a little bit narrow to me. Um, so in addition to everything Chase said, scoot the legs out a little bit more. That way you'll be able to sit in between your now wider stance. Anything else Anything else for carp on the squat? No. Um, okay. Over time, carp, just try to get your bar a little bit lower and doing stretches out there on the, the YouTubes to show the you tubes. how to get the bar a little bit lower. All right. This guy is quite the equipped home gym, everybody. It's pretty neat. He did. I think he had like strength co plates and all that. I think he has strength co plates. He has a television and a scooter. Oh fuck! He lives like a living. king. He does. <laughs> and a headband. What the hell? Nope. Heels. Excellent grind, my man. Chase, how are you feeling about these bad boys? Um, I need to see more hip action. Um, you're just kind of laying back and pressing. Yeah. Get your stance a little bit wider. Learn how to deduce 
your hips going forward versus a layback. So if your shoulders are kind of just moving freely, your belly button has a really changed space, that's layback. But if your pockets are noticeably going forward, your weight's kind of shifting forward in your toes a little bit, that's what we want. Now you're going to have to build off of that, really reach out, and do that fast so that we, we generate a bounce with the bar and we're able to press it. I think there's a, there's a, there's a non-negligible amount of weight on the bar here. Um, yeah, good, good pressing. I would say that you have misunderstood the purpose of the hip motion in the press, unless mm -hmm. you were considering these strict presses with a layback, um, rather than the Olympic press, the press 2.0 or the hips throwing press. Um, we want the rhythm to be hips and press, hips and press, hips and press, not hips press immediately together in one, you know, instant. Um, the bounce needs to happen so that you can let the bar dip a little bit, get that stretch reflex, and then pop back up with it. Um, if you just jam the hips forward while also pressing up at the same exact time, you'll fall into this layback, which is helpful. You're still getting the head out of the way, but you're not helping the bar move up any real amount. Um, so I would recommend thinking about pressing late, thinking about getting a little bit of rhythm to it. It goes hips, then press, hips, then press. You're throwing your hips forward, you're waiting for that bounce, that's the and count, and then you press the bar up. Um, I would I would really slow these down altogether. Um, there's one good Nick Delgadillo video on the on the tubes um, where he goes behind the lifter and then he pushes the bar down to get the bounce feeling right there. Um, if you have a buddy, you can go do that. If you just have Nick Delgadillo pressing Q, you'll probably you'll probably find it. Um, but these are pretty mm -hmm. solid presses to start, man. The bar path is bar path is there. Um, the layback is also causing the heels to come up off the ground. But I think if we fix the rest of the issues, that won't be a big problem anymore. Yeah, I agree. We got one more carp, Carpanian lift here from Coach Carp. What do you think he's a coach of? Fishing. I think he's like a, a scooter coach. Cause it's Coach Carp, like... man. Yeah, the scooter has moved, so he could be like pop, pop and sick, like kick flips, whatever a scooter trick is. I don't know. Bunny hops. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to power clean the next one. I guarantee it. It's going to fly the hell up there. Man, what a grind. Long torso, my man. Rep two was much faster than rep one, dog. Mine's still slow on my end, I guess. Yeah, yours could be artificially slowed down, Chase. Oh, shit. Is that tricky? Is that the man himself? Is that tricky trick? Six nine six nine six nine. What's up, dog? How's married life treating you down under? I got a few more Australian clients now. They're coming after your numbers, dude. I'm thinking one of them could get to an easy two seventy five kilo pull in his career. So he's he's coming after you, trick. Send in some videos, man. We'd love to see those next week. Is Australia kind of calming down with all this bullshit? I guess now. Oh, absolutely not. Oh, okay. No, mm -mm, no. I was just talking to one of them about that today. Um, yeah, no, they're 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 still going uh, hard in the paint there on all the craziness. Yeah. How are we feeling about uh, carps? Carps deadlifts here. Carp. I think Alex was very um, intuitive and he had a good point about this torso, right? So it's kind of not working to your advantage. Um, you're gonna have to kind of modify your stance to allow yourself to basically artificially shorten your torso. In your legs, why not the toes, but then keep the heels in just a little bit so it looks like a, an exaggerated like frog stance. And don't let your ass sink down too much because now you're just kind of squatting the load up. Keep your hips up high, get uncomfortable, set the back and push. Oh my god. All right. So this is Fury and Q8. What a name. All right. The most important thing. Tricky trick. He said he's going to send some videos there. He had meniscus surgery from a work incident. So on my way back to the thickness, Tricky was shot in the knee defending his country's president or prime minister, whichever one it is. I We have no way of knowing. God damn, man. That sucks. Hopefully, how long ago was the surgery trick? Hopefully you didn't have too much quad atrophy from that. Hopefully they didn't take the approach of just kind of locking the knee in position with one of like the framed braces and be like, Hey, you can get an extra five degrees a week. Hopefully you didn't have that recovery rope. Um, but some more notes on uh, Carpanian deadlifts here with coach carp. Um, 
I would just think about getting your shins out of the way. When you have to pull, you want to think about having vertical shins. If there, if you feel like there's an incline to your knee, uh, incline to your shin, excuse me, the hips are probably too low. You know, um, it's it's going to feel a little bit weird. It may feel like it's behind midfoot. Um, but like the difference between rep one forward of midfoot, you're wearing your shin savers, so I'm assuming you have problems with the bar running into your shins. Um, and then rep two, the hips are a little bit higher, the shins seem to be out of the way, and then the bar moves faster. You know. Um, September 9 was a surgery. He squatted 170 for some sets of three the other day, not the 205 uh, times five. I was, but I'll be back. That's sick, man. Ah, oh, man. Surgery was September. That's not terribly long ago, man. Good, good job on the recovery. That's pretty awesome. All right. Um, let's check out these squats. Interesting. Trick. Mick is going to be... This may be the thing that convinces Mick to come back on the podcast. It's his regular dose of the Australian manliness that is Tricky Trick 6969. Mm-hmm. All right, hold on. Moving past these. How are you feeling about these squats, Chase? Stance looks pretty damn wide. It is a very wide stance. Um, it's getting fairly that, deep looks... for how wide it is. Yeah, I mean, these actually look pretty damn good. It's just wide stance. So uh, it's going to be a little bit different once we kind of narrow in those stance, but uh, heels need to be underneath the shoulders. Um, again, you're probably going to go even lower now that you're you're coming in considerably with the uh, the stance. So you're going to have to probably think about squatting a little bit higher now. But everything else, good. Uh, you're staying in balance. You're hitting hip drive, all that stuff. There's something eerily off about these towards the finish. Um, yeah, narrow the stance up. Sit straight down into your heels. Um, you may be overthinking about leaning over, I think. I, I, um, I yeah, would like to see these heavier. His knees. Yeah, these are, uh, these are think, so leany. I just think it's just because of his stance. I think it's the stance, like too, once, yeah. Yeah, once we get his stance in, he'll bend his knees and stuff. Yeah, send in another video, uh, Furion. Um, cool name, dog. Uh, and then with more weight on the bar, narrow the stance. I think these will look really pleasant when that when those changes occur Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think we'll just have to see more no two ways about that and then who do we got here we have jalen it's either jay allen or jalen i like jalen you like (laughs) jalen all right my man's rocking the soft belt which is good soft belt gang you think press or squat Squat. Damn. Yeah, it's going to be a squat. It could be a behind the neck uh, jerk. Yeah. Oh, that's hell yeah. Yeah, we got some fixing to do on this one, Jalen. He is still yet to squat on my screen. So, uh, are you serious, Chase? I'm not joking. God damn. Dude, fuck my internet. I, I don't understand how it's so bad. It's, it's a travesty. It is a travesty. Um, all right. So Jay Allen, uh, I would really like to see your deadlift. I think back extension is the big issue here. Um, what we're seeing is that as you are descending, you are further rounding your back, like shaping it like a question mark to reach depth. Okay. Um, what you want to think about is keeping your chest and torso as rigid as possible and having the movement come from your knees and your hips. Um, we really don't want to see a lot of movement around your pecs, around your chest and things like that. Um, what I want you to think about is aiming your sternum, this bony plate in the middle of your chest, aiming that up at the wall in front of you the entire time. I don't want you to aim that at the floor. The problem here right now is that you're trying to lean over a ton in the squat but you're just rounding your back to do that and you're shoving your elbows up at the ceiling. We want you to point your elbows down to the ground, show your chest off, show your pecs off to someone standing in front of you, um, and then sit straight in between your heels. Um, We're trying to overcorrect from a very overly leaned over pattern right now, so the cues are gonna be a little bit different. Um, I would recommend widening the stance here as well. I think the stance is a little bit too narrow, um, too narrow for sure. Chase, did he start squatting on your screen yet? Yeah, he's good now. I don't think <laughs> the stance is too wide, but definitely. I mean, yeah, I meant too like, narrow. Or too narrow. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I think his stance is fine. I think okay. um, everything you said was good, but um, just think of it as like you're trying to make the bar roll down your back, right? Almost like it's trying to shave off part of your ass instead of rolling up on your neck. So that's mm-hmm. going to be the big kind of 
telltale sign if you're doing all those cues of what Alex said correctly. Yeah, I think the the gaze may be helpful too. It's like you can pick the chest up while also looking down. You know, like the, you can you can attain that position. Um, but if you can't figure out how to pick your chest up to get that back extension we're talking about, um, you may want to consider moving your nose up a little bit. Aim your nose slightly up. Um, I would really like to see your deadlift, dog. So send one of those in because um, yeah. if you just can't get the back extension on the deadlift, it could be one of those things where you're not going to figure out on the squat because you don't have it on the deadlift at all. And then who else do we got? We got a press coming in. His name is just press. So, I mean, who knows how that's going to go. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were talking about the lift. Is it an actual press or is okay, it is. I think this may be that gentleman from last time. Just the file name got screwed up. Remember the guy lifting in the dark? Is it him? Yeah, it doesn't look like the I same think it could setup. be him. I think it's the same rack. Ooh, we see some push press action. It's a hard triple. Do we got any more? That's it. Yeah, it's a triple. What do you think, Chase? Definitely need to lighten the load. And just like how we we're talking with Coach Carp here, distinguish your knees from bending versus your hips going forward. So you got to actually throw the hips forward, um, get all that rhythm going, and press more efficiently. Yeah, Grant Brogy just put out a good video on this on the on the YouTube channel. If you just look up like press Grant Brogy starting strength, you'll find it. And um, where he goes over the purpose of the hips in the press, what they're doing forward, why they're there in the first place, all that jazz. Um, I would recommend a higher bottom position. Your bottom position is like right at your collarbones. You're really trying to pull your neck up and get your hands down. Think about floating the bar right under your chin. And then what that'll do generally is pull the elbows up. So rather than having the elbows down here, and I want to keep the bar near my collarbones, I can get the bar near my chin and then my elbow can go up. It'll be forward of the bar. That's really helpful. Um, modify the elbow position, all the stuff Chase said. It's me guys, Lucas. Which one were you? Or are you the one pressing L7? Same guys before. So you're ah, right, I guess. Uh -huh. There we go, man. Yeah, thanks well, for Well, Lucas, I'm glad you got some show. damn lights in your, your garage here. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah yeah now you can see where all the plates are he's been misloading his bar the entire time um yeah keep sending in videos uh lucas l7 um all right aaron how do i know when to throw in power cleans good question chase what do you got we've talked about this in several other podcasts but um basically you can do it um anytime i feel like let's say first week you've you've done the deadlift at least twice Warm up with the power clean. Um, it's not going to be that hard. It's not going to be that taxing at the start. It's a bunch of technique. And then once you kind of get tired of power cleaning for a little bit, do your deadlifts. Yeah, I think uh, if you're interested in Olympic lifting and you're interested in doing the power clean, add it in early. Um, the fatigue cost of learning the power clean early is pretty minimal frankly. The deadlift isn't going to be super tiring by that point yet. Neither will the power clean. So you have the resources to spare. Um, I believe Rip went over this pretty well in the Olympic lifting episodes. So if you look up Starting Strength Radio, Olympic lifting, you'll find an episode which kind of covers uh, a lot of that stuff. Um, Chase and I are on the same page here. I'll have my guys warm up for the deadlift with the power clean. So it's like, hey, mm. you're pulling 405, get your cleans in at 225, get a few sets of three in, you're sufficiently warm for the deadlift, move on to your working sets. Um, so it's a, it's primarily, I would say, interest-based. Um, if you are doing sports, which involve you going quickly, I would recommend adding them earlier than you think you need to. Yep. Um, if you think that it's going to sabotage your deadlift or you're still getting easy deadlift gains, like let's say you're taking five pounds a week or five pounds a session three times a week in the deadlift, don't remove a deadlift slot for the power clean for no real reason, I would say. Yep. Um you know, if the deadlift is already starting to slow down, that's your time to add it in, I would say, for sure. Any other parting shots, Chase? No, I agree. Um, if you want to be really good at power cleaning and snatching, got to do them early. You got to do them. That's why Chase trains three times a day. Cleans in the morning, snatches the Bulgarian, in the afternoon, yeah, the Bulgarian jerks at method. night. Yep, that's exactly. it. Exactly. Three lifts, man. That's it. His relationship with his family and his loving wife and child are crumbling. He's in the mm -hmm. gym 24-7. It's terrible. Um, these things have been an hour and 10 minutes like the past four times we've done them, Chase. Fuck it. I think we're doing good then. We're just kind of blabbering at this point. We're being more efficient at talking. 
Yeah, this is maybe less efficient at talking. I don't know. <laughs> I'll watch the average view time for this, and then the average view time that we'll get is between 20 and 30 minutes. So if you're still watching, thank you very much. Um, we're putting up the best comment of the day down here. Talking about, I don't like deadlifting. The worst lift. It has dead in the name. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, you can find us at the contact information below. Uh, links in the description, all that jazz. But thank you guys very much for watching.